Dr. Elizabeth, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Katie. Well, I'm excited to learn from you on various topics today, but before we jump into the health world, I have a fascinating note from your bio. So you also have five kids and I have a note that every year you guys go somewhere in the world with only the getting there and the destination planned. (laughs) And I'm definitely a planner, but I love that approach so much. And I would love to hear what was the impetus for making that a family tradition and where are some of the most fascinating places you've been? I, I think we started that, I think when my, we really started doing that when my youngest who's now 16, was about six or seven. We thought, okay, he's old enough to throw a backpack on him now. Um, And so we all started, you know, and before then it was a little bit, he was just a little too young. So we said, okay, you know, my husband and I were always into adventures. And, you know, you have a lot of kids, it gets, that starts to be harder when you have kids. But we thought, okay, they're ready. Let's get them out in the world. So we threw backpacks on and we took him to, uh, I think Greece was one of the first trips we did with him. And, you know, um, I, it, it was, it was certainly not the easiest thing in the world when you're six, seven years old and running around with your little backpack on trying to, to maneuver your way through these, these countries, but it was one of the best adventures. And, you know, it's, it's a little, it, when you're that age, you kind of remember sometimes more of the, the bad things than the good things on it. <laughs> but I remember, you know, vividly we'd gotten into town and he was, you know, had horribly just sick as a dog stomach stuff. And so, you know, he's six years old. He's like, I have to go to the bathroom. I have to go to the bathroom. I have to go to the bathroom. So you're like, you know, as a mom, you know, this, you're running and trying to find a bathroom with this little kid. And basically we made it almost to this bathroom. And then he just, you know, has an accent everywhere. I mean, you know, <laughs> everywhere. So now I've got these pants that are dirty and I have to basically, you know, kind of stuff them into a trash can, wrap my shirt around his, you know, him, and then we make to a, to a store to, a, to try and buy some new clothes for him. And I think that's like, the, the one point that has stuck in his head all the way till now at 16. And he still gets teased about it by the rest of the kids, but. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure. Cause if you probably weren't doing like luxury travel either. No, we stay in hostels. We, you know, actually the good trick actually, cause you have a big family too, is cause hostel rooms are made as dorm rooms, right? So there's seven, seven or eight beds to a room. So you actually all get your own bed and you get you can have you take over the whole hostel room. So you in hostels are oftentimes now in these sort of really nice places or in the middle of towns, and so you can get this really, you know, great huge room with eight beds for, and you take over the whole room, so you don't have to share with anybody you don't know, and it makes the perfect place. But so we really do a lot more hostel traveling, sleeping on ferries. And we really just throw our backpacks on and go. So it's um, so it's always fun. Last year we went to Peru, uh, did a lot of trekking through Peru, trekked up to Machu Picchu, and and uh, and then this year we're going to Spain. I'm just going to hit all over Spain. So it, it, it's it, it's incredibly fun and it's such good bonding because you actually get your kids off of their cell phones and computer games and things like that. And you're all just together. I love that. And it sounds like you've figured out a way to do it in a like a pretty budget friendly way, which would make it accessible to a lot of families that might otherwise not consider it. And- exactly. I mean, you really can do it pretty cheaply, especially some of these less expensive countries. Like if you go to Asia, places like that, you really can do it cheap. I think people get a little scared to just kind of do this, but it really does work out. Things, you know, you talk to people, you learn along the way and it really does work out. I don't think everything has to be planned out into some big hotel. You can find places to stay that are, you know, safe and reasonable and still do it with a big family. And the thing I love most about that, because we've traveled quite a bit too, is that looking back in my own life, I can realize like some of my tougher experiences ended up being really formative and helpful later on. But as a parent, you don't want to like make their lives miserable on purpose, but travel has a lot of (laughs) built in discomfort. Exactly. Go through together. So it's a great bonding experience and a great out of comfort zone experience. Yeah. We often, we often say that, like, I think that one of the things that you know, I think life is a lot more comfortable. If you, if I look like my older patients, a lot of them have lived through pretty tough times. And I think it's, you know, aside from COVID, we haven't really lived through that many tough times. And our kids, I I think, unfortunately, don't really learn how to be uncomfortable, how to be a little hungry and have, you know, how to be a little bit too tired and how to carry your heavy backpack, even when you're miserable. You know, I think that those are things that do sort of have some really good formative you know, from a behavioral standpoint. So I do think it's a really good thing to kind of make yourself a little bit uncomfortable now and then. I agree. And I, well, I'm sure we could like very easily have a whole conversation just about parenting and maybe we'll get to one day. I also (laughs) want to make sure I learn from your medical expertise because you have a lot of knowledge in a lot of different areas. And so to start off broad, I would love to tackle the concept that you've talked about of the problems with our healthcare system and what we can do about it. Because I say on here a lot, at the end of the day, we're each our own primary healthcare provider. 
And the best outcomes happen when we can find awesome practitioners to work with us as a partner. And it seems like there's a lot of that in your approach as well, but you have much more inside knowledge on what are the problems with the medical establishment right now? Yeah, I think that's a big issue. Uh, you know, so I I come from a very traditional medical background, right? I basically was in the practice, an orthopedic practice, a big, large orthopedic practice for a lot of years. And, and you know, the problem with medicine is you're in this sort of day-to-day -day grind and you're just trying to see patients every 10 minutes as fast as you can. And that's not really conducive to making your patients well. You know, it's an unfortunate that that is the way medicine is developed. And we sort of say, okay, well, let's just patch things together. And keep people going, but we really don't make people well. And so really 17 years ago or so, I, I, I was a little frustrated with the fact that people would come in, you know, they'd come in with a hurt knee and you would really, you know, watch them go from having a little acute injury to severe arthritis a few years later and just kind of nurse them along along the way. You'd give a steroid shot, you'd do some PT, finally replace their joints and realize that it's got to be a better way to treat people and make them healthy. So I really went back to school 17 years ago and started retraining in regenerative or more health-focused anti-aging medicine and went back and got a fellowship in regenerative medicine and started trying to incorporate that into my practice. The problem was you couldn't really do it in 10 minutes. So we then opened Border Longevity Institute. So I was kind of wearing two hats. I'd see these orthopedic patients during the day and you know, kind of try and patch them back together. And then in the evenings, I'd come over here and actually get people healthy. So a couple of years ago, I finally brought it all together and do the orthopedic practice within my run, my more functional medicine practice, which has been much better for, for my clients. But what, what I really taught my patients is that there's no way your doctor can in 10 minutes tell you what you need to know. And then, and the other problem is you're working with a doctor who is pretty much stuck in their paradigm. It's really hard after going to school for as many years as you do in medicine to turn around and go, wow, maybe everything I'm doing is wrong. You know, it's kind of like you just built this amazing house, right? You just spent $5 million and built an amazing house. And then somebody comes in and goes, wow, I would have done this different, this different, this different. You don't want to hear it, right? So you just kind of do the things that you learned. You think they must be the right way because we've been doing them for 100 years and you keep doing it. And to say that maybe it's not the right approach is a pretty, it's a big blow to your ego. It's a big blow to everything you spend time doing. So there has to be the, okay, everything I'm doing might be wrong and I'm willing to change, which your doctor probably isn't going to do. So what, has to happen is you have to learn. And then you have to find a provider who can work as a team member with you. I always tell patients, if you come to a pa your, your provider with an article about something and they refuse to even look at it, then find a new provider. You should be able to learn with your provider, learn together, teach each other. I learn a lot from my patients. And you know, there's, there's things I don't know in my patients of research. If, you're, if you have a disease, you sometimes become the world's best expert at that. And so, you know, I learn a lot. My patients who, who have overcome things have found novel approaches that I might not have even thought of. So I think you have to find a provider who, who is willing to work with you on that. The, the problem is those are few and far between for exactly that reason. I mean, it, it is really hard. I mean, I, I could say I stuck steroids in knees for a hundred years and is it the right thing? Probably not. I was probably making a lot of people worse to turn around and admit that and say, okay, there's gotta be a better way is not easy. So I think you're, you're, to rely on your doctor to do that is probably difficult, if not impossible in a lot of cases. So our goal is to teach our clients and then work together with them. I'm guessing a lot of people listening might've had the patient equivalent of that experience where they have brought knowledge to their doctors and were kind of shut down. And I know people personally who have been told like, don't confuse your Google search with my medical degree. Exactly. So I feel like doctors like you are few and far between and rare gems when we can find them, but it makes me hopeful that people like you exist and that there are now such, there are good outlets for people who especially are willing to do the work and do the research and make the changes. And they just need a partner to work with them on the parts they can't do themselves. Exactly. You really have to search around and find people. And I think that network is getting a little bit bigger. There's more doctors who are sort of leaving the more traditional practices and, and, and starting to, to, take a different approach, but really has to be a doctor who you can be a team member with. You've got to be sort of the pilot co-pilot in this. And, and, you know, again, never do, if my patients want to try something and I think it's safe and potentially effective, I'm going to work with them to help them do, to, to do that. You know, that's, that should be my job. It's not, you know, I always say it's a little bit like your financial advisor, right? You know, your financial advisor is not 
he's going to say, this is what I think you should do, but ultimately he's not going to be putting the money in, 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 you know, in the account you are. And so I think the same thing has to be true. You're working together with somebody for your, the best end outcome. And I, like you said, I, I have people all the time where they come and go, my doctor said this. And I said, can you ask them to show me the article on why they're saying that? Cause I have never seen, you know, that approach. And if they can't show you the article, if they can't support it, and you can support what you're doing, then more power to you. That's what you should be doing. So we put together this whole academy. It's called Human Optimization Academy. That is, we're teaching people the way doctors should learn. We're teaching them by peer-reviewed literature. We're teaching them with courses that are, you know, step by step how to interpret your labs, how to how how to how to you know eat the right way. So all of these pieces are put together for people, and we're trying to teach it more in like a medical course as opposed to. Instagram influencers trying to teach you. That's awesome. And you touched on something else that I think is really important and that I wasn't even super aware of until recently, which is the joint health aspect, because I'm, I found out recently, like people my age are having joint replacements, which to me seems really young, but now I feel like this is like, it's in my awareness now. And I've just committed to doing a heptathlon. So I'm like aware of wanting to kind of like future proof my joints. Um, since I'm now trying to try these athletic endeavors for the first time in my thirties, but can you explain from the inside perspective, like what's wrong with the way we're currently thinking about joint health and what do we need to shift? So this is my passion because I'm coming from an orthopedic background into a functional medicine world. And even in this world, of health focused medicine, most people don't put joint health into that same category. They think about brain and they think about heart, you know, and blood sugar control and energy and libido. They think about all those things, but joints are just something that, you know, you overuse them, they wear out. And really that is very untrue. In fact, all the evidence supports that your knee arthritis is much more likely to be a problem if you sit in front of a TV than if you run. So we do not wear out our joints any more than you wear out your brain by using it too much or you wear out your heart because it beats too much. That just is not the way we're designed. So what happens is that we have genetic predispositions, just like you do to your brain health or your heart health or anything else. We have genetic predispositions. And so you may be more genetically challenged in terms of your joints. And then maybe you do get a little injury, right? You tweak your knee running. And Best case scenario, if everything was well, you would heal that injury, you'd go on and everything would do fine. But because a lot of us don't have everything we need, either from a diet perspective or a genetic perspective or the right supplements or the right hormones, what happens is you start this inflammatory process. And if that inflammatory process doesn't turn off, then you continue to degrade cartilage. So what we now know is that osteoarthritis what's always been termed wear and tear arthritis is not wear and tear. It is an inflammatory disease related to high levels of certain proteins that are damaging cartilage and certain enzymes that are damaging cartilage. And those enzymes not turning off appropriately. So you continue to eat away at the joint. So think about what happens with an injury. Your body has to come in and try and heal the injury. But then, so it brings in all these cleanup crew. So like little enzymes that sort of gnaw away at the damaged cartilage, those enzymes don't turn off. They start gnawing away at the good cartilage and you start this destructive pathway. So if you think about this as an inflammatory disease, just like wearing out your brain is, then you have to address it completely differently. It's not stay off your knee and then let's stick some steroid into it and then we'll replace it in 10 years. It is, let's stop the inflammatory process. Let's start, stop what has gone wrong in this joint. And so now we have very, you know, we have medications that are, that, that we can utilize to turn off these enzymes. We have uh, peptides and supplements that will change this whole inflammatory protocol. This needs to happen. Like even if, you know, I tore my first anterior cruciate ligament in my knee when I was 16, it's been a downhill course ever since then. So what happened in me is that I started this inflammatory process. I started the destructive process. Yes. Was it wear and tear? No, it was an overreactive immune system, just like what happens in other diseases. So we have to start thinking about this as a disease, not a natural wear and tear because you overused your joint. In fact, using your joint is, is probably a very good thing for it. So that is not taught. It's not how we're dealing with joints. 
unless we start shifting our paradigm on this into it is an inflammatory disease, not a wear and tear disease, we're going to continue to have problem. I always say, so you go to your orthopedic surgeon and you he's going to, let's, let's go in and clean that knee up, right? You hear this all the time. Somebody has a painful knee and they get an MRI scan and it shows a little, you know, a little tear in the cartilage and the orthopedic surgeon goes, well, let's just go clean it up. That's exactly the same scenario as you come in with your, your mother who's suffering from dementia and the, the neurologist you see goes, oh, well, let's just send you the neurosurgeon to like clean up those bad parts of the brain. Not going to work. Cleaning up bad parts of the brain makes the brain worse. Cleaning up bad parts of the joint increases inflammation, increases destruction. It's the first step to progressive arthritis is when somebody goes in there and starts destroying more cartilage by trimming it away. So for instance, arthros arthroscopic debridement of some joints here in the US is a bread and butter surgery. It's done, it's a number one surgery done by orthopedists. It's banned in every other country because it is so ineffective. And in fact, shows such significant progression of the disease process after people have arthroscopic surgery and so pushes them forward to a joint replacement much earlier that they've stopped allowing it in other countries like Europe. So we, we are, we're doing things wrong. It's not being taught. It's not being uh, spread even among my crew, my people who are progressive thinking, you know, functional medicine doctors. They sort of put joints into a different thing and send them back to the orthopedic surgeon. Wow. It makes sense when you explain it like that. And if it's an inflammatory disease, that means it's likely from the functional medicine side, having crossover effects other places in the body, if you've got that overactive immune system. And when you reframe it like that, it makes such logical sense that good forms of movement would actually be really like good right. and important for both prevention of that and recovery of that. Um, and also for other areas as well, like I've heard muscle, your muscle tone be called the the muscle of, or like the organ of longevity. And so right. we're also building skeletal muscle, which we know correlates to hopefully longer life and better health span. Um, right. What blew my mind was reading about these um, like placebo or sham surgeries where they would do the surgeries on one group and just do an incision on the other group and send them to physical therapy. And there was no difference in outcome. And that blew right. my mind. Cause like you said, these, I mean, I know people my age having these surgeries. And actually two years down the road, the sham group did better than the surgery group. So, you know, the, the sham group actually didn't suffer the detrimental effects of having the surgery. So that study followed out. The people who had the real surgery actually were doing worse than the sham surgery people who were just treated with conservative measures. You know, we, we need to keep people moving. We need to treat them with the right nutrition. We need to have them continue to exercise. You're right. Muscle, muscle is the currency. It's, you know, muscle is actually an endocrine organ. It makes what are called myokines. It makes things that actually help repair so you've got to keep people moving. The, the worst thing you can do is tell somebody who comes in with, with joint pain, just rest, stop doing everything. Obviously, you have to work within a realm of not hurting, but you've got to keep them moving. That makes sense. And it makes me curious from your perspective, since you're on the ground with this every day, like what some of those approaches are that we can do both from a preventative perspective or for people who already have joint pain to sort of undo that inflammation and to work backwards from a restorative perspective versus like the just steroids in the knee kind of perspective. Right. So that's where if you think about it as an inflammatory immune process, and there's actually a couple of very specific, something called interleukin one beta um, these metal matrix proteases, something called MMP3, those we know are very, very elevated in these joints. So how do we bring those down? Well, number one, we know that actually having, you know, why, why do you see people get more arthritis as they age? Well, one of the things is the loss of hormones. So for instance, progesterone. Progesterone women start losing in their early 30s, right? Sometimes even younger. And, and progesterone actually is very anti-inflammatory. It helps our immune system. So it's an immune modulator. So it helps to lower those inflammatory proteins. There's also progesterone receptors on joints. We always think about progesterone for the uterus, right? But there's progesterone receptors on joints. There's progesterone receptors in our brain. So progesterone becomes a very, very key player in healing and recovery. So as women start gaining their 30s and 40s and on, and their progesterone levels start dropping, they get these more creaky, achy joints. And then you start seeing, okay, now I need to have my knee scoped, my hip scoped, and now I need to have my joint replaced. Oftentimes a little bit of progesterone, particularly for back pain. I used to treat women with back pain all the time with just giving them some progesterone, their back pain would go away. So you've got to get hormones balanced. That's really very, very important, right? And then look at where there's potentially micronutrient deficiencies and things like that. But we use a lot in our practice what are called peptides 
to help repair joints and, and work on these processes. So if peptides are, are basically short chains of amino acids. A protein is 50 amino acids or more. A peptide is less than 50, okay? So it's basically just amino acids put together. So you have an arginine, glycine, cysteine, basically all put together in different sequences and those make up peptides. And people always think about, well, I'm going to put some foreign thing that's not approved in my body. So peptides your body makes. For instance, insulin is a peptide. So basically, your body, you eat glucose, your body makes insulin, insulin goes to heal. Same thing happens with other peptides in our body. So for instance, our gut makes a peptide called BPC, body protective compound, or BPC-157. BPC-157 is made by the gut in response to both healing the gut. So it's really good for healing the gut, but also for healing joints. So if you have an injury or a tendon to a ligament to a joint, you can use BPC-157. You can give back the same peptide that your body is making less of because you're older or because you genetically don't make as much or because you've had, you've taken a lot of, of things that have depleted the sources of it. So we can give back this amino acid sequence and help your body to heal faster. BPC-157 is not only immune modul modulatory, it actually helps improve collagen function. It will help brain, so it's actually preventative for brains, and it's really good for the gut, unlike anti-inflammatory drugs, which destroy the gut. So you've got this wonderful anti-inflammatory that's actually beneficial to you, much safer than taking a bunch of Advil, and yet people don't know about it, people don't use it. So, so, that's, so that's one of the approaches. And then there's another peptide called thymosin beta-4, which is made by when we're young, we have this giant gland in our chest. It's called the thymus gland. And the thymus gland, huge when we're babies. So if you look at a baby, it takes up their entire chest. If you look at an x-ray of a baby's chest, they've got this big, huge mass in there. And that's the thymus gland. Thymus gland is really helping when we're little to, to help us grow and heal and, and keep, that's why you, know, you don't see kids get injured for long, right? And it also is a really key player, the thymus gland in our immune system. So when we're babies, our immune system needs to know, attack that, it's bad, don't attack self, you're good. So we have to teach our immune systems that. So in babies, we're teaching our immune system that. At puberty, this giant gland starts to shrink. By the time you're old like me, it's this little teeny fatty thing in your chest that's not doing anything. So we've lost the thymic peptides. What does that do? Our immune system goes haywire. We don't have the education to our immune system anymore. So we start getting less immunocompetent. So old people start dying of viruses and things like that. Inflammation starts increasing. But thymus and beta-4 is also really important for collagen actin healing. So you need it for joint healing. So you can use that combination of BPC, thymus, and beta-4 to help heal joints, heal tendons, heal ligaments much more rapidly than, than you can just by throwing somebody on Advil, which is not going to do anything to heal them. So replacing the hormones, replacing the peptides that we've lost in our body. I always say you've got to replace what's lost, replacing those peptides that you lose in your body. Um, and then lastly, we use what are called repurposed drugs. So one of my passions is understanding the cell. Everything comes down to our cell going haywire for most diseases, same disease process. The cell is dysfunctional. It's not doing things right. So how do we fix these different pathways? If I know interleukin-1 beta is high in you because you've got this bad joint and metallomatrix protein, protease is high, what can I find that blocks those? So I go back to the literature and I say, oh, look, this drug, we use it for something else. It's, but what it, the way it works is by blocking these. So there's a drug that's probably going to come to market in a couple of years called xylosol. And right now, it's an oral medication used for bladder inflammation. The way it works on bladder inflammation is by reducing those things I said was high, those bad enzymes and those bad, those bad proteins. So we can get that drug. It's called Elmeron, except orally, it doesn't work for joints. But if you get it, if you have it made into an injectable form, it works incredibly well to not only stop progression of arthritis, but actually rebuild cartilage. So the company that makes this drug coming to market again in a couple of years. So they're kind of fast tracking it through, through trials actually just completed 
in their phase three trials where they showed MRI scan improvement in cartilage heights. We know we actually didn't just stop the progression and stop the pain. We actually reversed the arthritis with this drug. So we've been using this drug for about three years because it is available. Once you understood what it did, right? We could find this drug. We could have it made into a compounded medication that can be injected in and it can reverse. It dramatically helps with pain, but it can also reverse arthritis. So by using those kind of techniques, we're addressing the problem. We're correcting the things that have created the abnormal immune function, the ongoing inflammation. And now we've thrown something into the mix that may actually be a cure because it's completely working on what is dysfunctional in this disease. So that's the way we kind of approach all diseases is looking at these pathways and where can we pull in things that we know exist to help these pathways. Does that make sense? It does. And it seems like you're taking it like a truly first principles approach by not just building on assumptions that already exist within the industry, but going back to the root cause and then asking better questions from the ground up, which I think in any discipline leads to typically better answers than just building on assumptions and trying to iterate slightly from existing assumptions. Um, but it makes me curious because a couple of things you said stood out of like the anti-inflammatories having a negative effect on the gut. And I've been volunteer coaching some high school athletes this year. And whenever any of them get any kind of injury, the advice given to them is typically take anti-inflammatories 24 seven for at least a week, probably two weeks rest and like stop moving all these things that are, go counterintuitive to everything that you just said. So it makes me curious what things as parents are foundational to joint health, health at a young age while kids are still in that great stage of immune system health and muscle development. And that you wish you had known maybe at 16 when you had that first injury. Yes. It's very interesting. So my 16 year old just broke his ankle playing volleyball. And, and, you know, so my approach to him was extremely different, right? Number one, we know that anti-inflammatory drugs impede bone healing. They slow bone healing. We want some inflammation. When you acutely hurt yourself, it's a little bit like when you have a, when you have a, an illness, fevers are not bad. Fevers get bad if they, if they go on or if they're too high, but fevers are your body's immune system trying to create an inflammatory response to fight off that virus. Now, if I hurt myself, the first thing I want is I want my body to try and start an initiative, initiate a healing process. That's inflammation. Inflammation is not a bad thing acute. We want it to come in. That's what starts the healing. So if I blunt all that acute inflammation, that's not necessarily a good thing, right? Sometimes you have to use them because pain is too severe, things like that. So but I'll use them. So I'll use them at, at, at a minimal level. So you, you really, anti-inflammatories are, they're a double-edged sword. Yes, they do help with pain, but that swelling inflammation acutely in that first week is actually critical to healing. So you really don't want to impede it. There's some great studies on people after surgeries, how much faster they heal by not using anti-inflammatory drugs. And in fact, a study that, that came out on, on joint replacements recently with, with hip replacements showed that the people who did not take anti-inflammatories fared much better than the people who did. So we may be not doing the right thing by icing anti-inflammatories and resting. We may want to actually start some gentle motion, not actually throw a bunch of ice on it acutely, using it just as you need it. Obviously getting the joint up, you know, you're not going to stand up on your broken leg right away. But as soon as you can start moving, you want to. So from, from my son, what I did is I obviously put him into a cast boot because he had a broken leg, but I stuck him on BPC and thymus and beta-4. He did not take anti-inflammatories. He did not overdo ice. He iced a little bit. He kept it elevated just because it was, painful that first few days, but he was, you know, as soon as he was able to, I had him, you know, up walking partial weight bearing with crutches and, and a, a boot using the BPC, using the thymus and beta four, increasing his protein load. Right. So you talk about, you know, it's hard. You've got six kids, you know, how hard it is to get them to eat well, especially teenage boys, right. That's not their forte is not to, to eat healthy. They go, they tend to go for carbs and sugar, but what we need for healing is a whole lot of protein. So you've got to be really pushing an increased protein intake. So you've got to get their protein and take up 150 grams of protein into them. So you've got to increase protein, get them off of the carbs and sugar, start them moving, ideally limit the number of anti-inflammatories you're taking with them. Ice acutely old, probably isn't the best thing. So it's some very interesting data on whether our old, you know, rice, rest, ice compression is the right thing. Um, I think, again, you always have to, to try and get their pain under control. So sometimes you, it's, it is a lesser of two evils. So that's the approach that needs to be taken. And had I done, you know, and, and then for instance, when a, a, a severe injury, like 
a tear to a ligament, something like that, where you're now facing surgery, what we'll do is put these people on these kids on, on Pentacin. So on this drug, xylosol, because we can, we have access to it. We'll also do a procedure where we'll actually take a protein out of their blood. It's called alpha two macroglobulin. It's a protein that we can actually isolate out of the blood, which actually initiates a healing response very acutely. So basically you can take this protein out of the blood, inject it right after surgery and really blunt the over regressive inflammation and stop this downhill surmise. We know that people after anterior cruciate ligament tears, 80% of them go on to develop arthritis. How do we avoid that? We stop this overactive inflammation. So getting them to eat right, getting them to move, avoiding the anti-inflammatories. If you have access to these peptides, again, that's limited, you know, by who you know. Um, they're, they're, you can heal much, much faster with those kind of, those types of things, but there's supplements that can be helpful there too, in terms of healing. Um, you know, so, so there's things that you can, you can sort of add in like collagen, especially a collagen called Fortigel collagen, we know can enhance healing. So, you know, using collagen, high dose vitamin D is going to enhance collagen production. Um, vitamin C is going to enhance collagen production. So some supplements you can add in, usually use Fortigel collagen that Fortigel type collagen powder, mix it with a little vitamin C and, and some vitamin D and you'll enhance healing. And those seem also really good to know from the preventative side as well. I'm so glad you brought up protein. Anytime I get a chance to step on the protein soapbox, I'm all for it because it, it took me way too long to learn this lesson. And I've seen at yeah. least anecdotally how much drastically better I feel when I eat enough protein, how much I mean, it amazing... build muscle, like it is night and day, like night and day. Um, we are so underdosing protein, the old adage of 0.7 grams of protein per kilogram body weight, weight is too little protein. You know, it's, it really should be a, a gram of protein per pound of, of lean body mass. So if, you know, I'm, I'm 135 pounds, I need at least 135 and I do a lot of muscle building. I need, you know, I, I shoot for 140, 150 grams of protein a day. It's hard to do, you know, that's not easy. Um, and our kids, I look at my son, you know, and I'm trying to, you know, push protein shakes into them and things like that. It is hard to get enough protein. And then we kind of say, oh, as we get older, we need less protein. Exactly the opposite. We need more protein as we age. So, you know, when you get to be my age where, you know, it's harder to maintain bone, it's harder to maintain muscle, you've got to get protein intake. And it's, when I look at my little old ladies who are, you know, who are 80, I look at the protein intake. Sometimes they're getting 30 grams of protein. They need 150 grams of protein and they're, you know, and they're not eating much and, you know, and so of course they start losing muscle and they start losing bone. So you're exactly right. I'm on that protein soapbox all the time. And it's funny. I like this one patient, she's like 75 years old and she's, she's very healthy. But I, I said, you've got to get your protein intake up. She's like, oh my God, you're killing me trying to eat this much protein. But now she feels so much better. Like what you said, me too. I mean, honestly, when I get enough protein in, it is massive how different I am like at the gym and my weightlifting, how much better it is. Yeah. And just baseline energy. And I get it. It is difficult. Like I am finding the, very much that eating enough protein is the hardest part by far. It's not the workouts. Those get really fun. <laughs> Getting enough protein every day is the hard part, but I'm trying to build it into the family culture also as a mom and first of all, model it for them. And second of all, make sure there's always protein available because it seems like, and it makes sense, like they get sick less often. They recover faster if they're getting enough protein, even just from hard workouts, they recover so much faster. And the developing brain needs a lot of protein, right? So, you know, so you look at these kids who are eating nothing but carbs and sugar and, you know, and, and what's happening to their brains. And of course, we're going to see ADD and ADHD and all these things. When honestly, if you can just get these kids really, you know, it, it's it, what I would say, it's protein first. It's, you know, the first thing you eat is protein. Um, and if, you know, if you're not full after that, then, then you can add some carbs in. But, you know, it's, it's honestly, you've got to load the protein first. Absolutely. And also I'm curious, so you, you've explained the whole process by which joints have issues, then it gets worse over time for someone who is at one of the more advanced stages of that, or has been told they maybe need a joint replacement. Are there still alternative approaches that sometimes work or at that stage is joint replacement, the actual best option? It probably depends on, you know, if somebody truly is now just bone on bone and, you know, they're having horrific pain uh, then joint replacements can be life-saving and they, they're, they can really, you know, hugely change people's lives. And so I'm not going to say they're never needed, but up until that very end stage, there is so much we can do. I have so many people who have been told there's nothing you can do except a joint replacement. And, you know, and they are pretty close to bone on bone and we put them on 
on, on xylosol and pentosan polysulfate. And we, we start them on some peptide therapies. And then we will do, uh, you know, regenerative procedures. This alpha-2 macroglobulin I was talking about, where we, we take blood, we spin out this protein that's very helpful to healing and recovery. We'll inject that into the joint. And then you could use stem cells. All of these things can be really beneficial. And I would say, you know, I, I certainly have patients who I, I look at them and go, you know what, the, the best thing for you is to just replace the joint. It's going to be the most cost-effective way to kind of get around this. But 80% of the people we see are not, there's other, other options for them. And again, with this data that just came out was with penicillin polysulfate showing, you know, I think 30% improvement in cartilage height in the group who was on the drug versus 4% loss in cartilage in the group who was on a placebo, we're reversing these changes. We used to say you couldn't do that. Well, now we know you can. And now when you add in these other things, it's going to be even better. So we see people who are pretty much, you know, the, the only hope they've been given is joint replacement. I would say 80% of them, there's something more you can do. 20% of them, I'm going to say, you know what, the best thing for you is just go replace the joint. That's great. But to know. I'm going to caveat that with, if you're going to go replace that joint, remember this is still a disease. Why did, you know, so many people... They have the left hip replaced and now the right hip goes and their knee goes, you've not treated the disease, right? So you still have to go back to that person and go, let's replace this hip and then let's get this disease under control. You still have the disease. Your other joints are going to go. You're going to have problems. Let's treat the inflammatory disease too. That makes sense. It's a whole missing piece. And you do see that cascade a lot. I know so many people who, as they've gotten older, have had so many joints replaced and it seems like it just keeps escalating. Yeah, it's just, escalating, right, just a cascade. Gotcha. Well, and to circle back to peptides for a minute, um, we talked about them in the bubble of joint health, but I know that there are many uses for these for longevity, for other purposes outside of joint health, and that you work with a lot of patients on this. So can you give us kind of, I know it could take hours and hours to get through all of it, but an overview of who can benefit from peptides and what other uses peptides have? I think everybody can benefit from peptides. Again, I if people get so scared of these things are like, oh, that's some, you know, wacky stuff. And again, these are things that are largely, a lot of the peptides we use are naturally made by our body, meaning they're endogenous. We make these. They're chains of amino acids that we make. We can just give back, again, give back what's lost, right? If we can keep our peptide levels, just like our hormone levels, to where they were when we were younger, we're going to fare better in the world of longevity. You remember this, there's, a, there's at least 140 peptides right now that are in clinical trials for treating diseases. So the, the pharmaceutical world is on to peptides. It's not as though, you know, those are just a functional medicine world thing. There's, you know, 140, and there's 60 that are FDA approved for cancer, orthopedics, fertility. So they're, they're being utilized in every field. These are not some sort of wacky thing that's just out there being done, you know, among the non-traditionalists, you know, so, so. The hard thing about peptides is you need to know how to use them. You need to know how to get them. They should be from compounding pharmacies, not just bought off the internet. But you can use them for, for all sorts of pieces of longevity. So for instance, I, I think the one that, I've, that has come to, you know, that everybody's hearing about, right, is, is ozempic or semaglutide. Semaglutide is a peptide. So it's called a glucagon-like peptide receptor agonist, GLP-1 agonist. So it's a peptide. We've been using semaglutide as a peptide long before it started getting making its way into Hollywood world of weight loss. So now everybody's heard about it for weight loss. It has a huge another other benefits for brain health, for cardiac health. These GLP-1 agonists have a lot of other benefits. So we've been using semaglutide from a longevity, health, brain perspective for years before it kind of became this, you know, evil drug that's helping people lose weight. Um, and I will say it's a great drug for helping people lose weight. So, you know, so, so, that's one that can be very useful. Growth hormone, you, you know, years and years and years ago, what we had to use to replace growth hormone, which, which declines in our 20s, right? Growth hormone starts declining. And that does contribute to loss of muscle mass, loss of bone, loss of brain health. So we want to keep growth hormone levels up if we want to age better. But growth hormone's expensive. It's a little sketch to get. And it's, I can tell you, because I was around before peptides, it's, it, it is hard to dose without getting side effects. It, it, it's it's very difficult because you're giving huge doses of growth hormone and then they'd be too high and then people get side effects. So we can use instead what are called growth hormone secretagogues. They're peptides that just make your body naturally release more of its own stored growth hormone. So it's much more well, homeostatic, much more like what your body is doing. It's just replacing the, the normal levels for you. So we can use what are called growth hormone secretagogues like CJC and ipamorelin. Those are great longevity tools. Um, 
it's, you know, so we can use them for, from, from that perspective, we can use them for brain, uh, for people who have cognitive decline, diseases like Parkinson's. There are a lot of, of what we call nootropic peptides, peptides that really help brain function. There's a peptide called dihexa that is, um, been being looked at in the Parkinson's world. So you can use, you know, but it's available again, it's just a chain of amino acids that, you know, that you can use as, as a peptide, as peptides that will help with sleep, There's something called deep sleep inducing peptide. So these, so they can use, be used in almost every realm. Um, mitochondrial health, energy levels, glucose control, all those things have peptides and that are much, much safer and more physiologic than their drug counter counterparts. And, I, I don't know that there's a disease that I can't come up with a peptide for, but if I sort of looked at just what I have most of my patients take from a longevity world, they're going to be using the growth hormone secretagogues. They're going to be using BPC and the thymic peptides to keep their immune systems healthy and keep their, their reparative processes on key. Then they're going to be doing things like cycling some of the, the, the peptides that are, are helpful for replacing mitochondria. Remember, mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cells. They will give us all our energy. As we age, the number of mitochondria decline. And if you look at the most mitochondrial dense tissues, it's brain, it's heart, it's muscle. Those are all the things that go as we age as well. So we can use a peptide called MOT-SC, which again, natural peptide that our mitochondria make. You can give that back and it tells your body to make more mitochondria. So I have people cycle on that. My goal in peptide is just like my goal in hormones. It is replace everything that is being lost so I can keep it at a level when I was 18, 20. And if I do that, the hope is I'm gonna delay the aging process and age in a much more healthy manner. Got it. And we've talked about things that seem like generally great rules of thumb for aging more gracefully, like consuming enough protein, getting the right kinds of movement. I would guess getting sunlight in the correct doses is probably one as well. And you mentioned progesterone before and how that for a lot of women in their thirties can become a factor. What form, I know this is a controversial topic, but what form of progesterone do you find helpful? And is that something that you think is worth for a lot of women actually replacing as they get older preventatively? I think all the hormones need to be replaced. They need to be replaced in, be replaced in synchrony. You know, if you look at the other thing that declines in both men and women and men, it's testosterone. You need that for muscle building. Um, progesterone is the one hormone that is safe taken orally. It's the only safe oral hormone. Estrogen and testosterone are not safe taken orally. So one of the problems with birth control pills is they increase clot risk. Transdermal estrogen does not do that. Only oral estrogen does. It's only after it goes through the liver. So you have to stay away from estrogen and testosterone, both of which are liver toxic if you take them orally. But progesterone is fine orally. In fact, it's better for the brain orally. Where the confusion comes in on the type of progesterone, there's only one type of progesterone. But what's in things like Premarin, which is what was sort of the drug that was used in the Women's Health Initiative study, which scared everybody away from hormones, is a progestin. It's not progesterone. Our bodies do not make progestins. They make progesterone. Progestins are a completely different compound and they have a very different effect. They do not help the brain. They do not help the joints and they are carcinogenic. So we've been using progestins in a lot of these, these sort of hormonal you know, things, including birth control pills, progestins instead of progesterone. And you have to give progesterone. Now, if you buy progesterone from a pharmacy it is the same as compounded progesterone. So there's this kind of, I think, elitism in, in the functional medicine world saying, oh, you know, you have to use bioidentical. Progesterone is progesterone. Estradiol is estradiol. Those are bioidentical. What is not bioidentical is using, is using things like progestins. So estradiol, whether I get it from my compounding pharmacy, whether I get it from as a patch from my regular pharmacy is still estradiol. Thing a compounding pharmacy allows me to do is use different forms of it. For instance, you know, I can dose it a little differently. I can, I can, you know, uh, use it as just a transdermal cream. But those, those are available and sometimes cheaper, less expensive through pharmacies. And I think that that I hear this all the time from you have to get this bioidentical estradiol. If it's estradiol, it is estradiol. It is bioidentical. So, so get that out of your head that there's this, you know. And I think it's an, I think it's a confusion even in the functional medicine world that that you know there's bioidentical estradiol. Estradiol is estradiol. So, so you, you can you can get estrogens from you know regular pharmacies. Again, you have to take estrogen transdermally to avoid the negative effects. 
When you look at things like blood clot risk, that is an oral estrogen risk. There's zero literature, zero, not one study that shows transdermal estrogen causes blood clots. So there's no evidence of that. It's also liver cysts from oral estrogen. So we know that oral estrogens are not good for us, but transdermals are not going to have that same effect. And they have a very good effect for brain, cardiac, muscle. They all need estrogens. So transdermal estrogen, transdermal or injections of testosterone, because that is liver toxic. But if you don't replace these things, you're, you really can't age well. I mean, I, the whole myth that hormones cause cancer is is outdated. It's based on a some flawed evidence that even the authors of the Women's Health Literature Study came back and said this study was misinterpreted, you know, and really it was just progestins that were causing cancer, estradiol not. In fact, estradiol patients did much better in terms of bone density, cardiac health. So we need to get that out of our head. We need to dose these appropriately. We need to we need to follow how they're being metabolized by people to do them right. But you've got to replace them if you're going to protect your brain and your heart. You have to replace testosterone if you're going to build muscle. I can send my patients to the gym all day long. If they have no testosterone, they're not going to see any benefits. And they're going to get frustrated, right? So if I look at, at you know, an older woman like my age, they're going to have almost no testosterone. And I'm going to say, you, you got to build muscle. They, they can't. <laughs> they're like, I go to the gym every day. I'm not building muscle. It's a little bit like me telling my, you know, you, you know we know sleep's important. If I don't have any progesterone, I can't sleep. I don't care how many times people say, you just need to meditate and turn off your TV and you know wear your blue light glasses and all will be fine. It's not. If you don't have progesterone, you are not going to sleep. So we have to kind of stop you know, blaming people and saying, you just need to eat better and sleep better. We have to give them back what they need to do that. And that includes things like hormones. And I'll say, in my mind, it includes things like peptides if we're really going to, to get, give the body back what it's lost at my age, right? I, if, if I think I'm going to, do it all with just exercise and diet. And, you know, and it, yes, those are critical players, critical, but it's, it, it you, you're going to have to give it some help as well. That's great. I got off topic from the question, but no, that was perfect. <laughs> are there any other generally helpful supplements or lifestyle factors that you recommend for people who are interested in the anti-aging or longevity side? I'm going to say from a lifestyle perspective, you've got to lift weights. I mean, I see so many people who, you know, get into the, just, they're running, they're doing, you know, they're, 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 you know, my, I'm in Boulder running is huge. Right. And I won't say there's not benefits to running, but it, you really have got to lift weights and you have to lift heavy weights. You can't just go and lift two pound weights. You really got to lift heavy. You've got to form muscle. Muscle is really critical to not only your, your bone health, it's important to your brain health. Our muscles produce, again, they produce BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor to help our brains. So it's really critical to build muscle. You've got to get in the gym and you've got to lift heavy weights, you know. Um, so I, I'm going to put that as kind of, you know, sort of top tier. You've got to lift weights. You can't just rely on, in fact, I'll put cardiac lower than, than weightlifting. You know, from, a, from a diet perspective, you could talk all day on diet, right? And <laughs> And it's very hard to know what the right diet is. Is it, you know, you've got the carnivores and you've got the vegans and everybody's got their, you know, and there's, there's evidence to support a lot of, it. I think a good sensible Mediterranean type diet works for most people. I think, you know, we all got into the time restricted eating and intermittent fasting, which is a great tool from a longevity perspective. It really is. What I find, however, is when people start getting into this restricted time, restricted eating, right? They're eating one meal a day or in a four hour window. I start looking at their protein and it's very deficient. So you have to sort of say, can I actually get enough protein? Can I get my 150 grams of protein in that four hour window? I can't. I mean, it, it, it's impossible for me to eat that much in my four hour window or to actually digest that much protein. So maybe some people can, but I think that's where we have to sort of weigh is that necessarily our, have we trended, you know, like all, all of our trends, sometimes we swing too far one direction. So I don't think Time-restricted eating practiced every day is a great thing. I think it needs to be potentially cycled on and off for the benefits. So from a diet perspective, I mean, I think a good, sensible Mediterranean-type diet, and I think that the time-restricted eating intermittent fasting needs to be done sporadically and not continuously if you look at the, the need for protein and nutrients. From a supplement perspective, I mean, you mentioned sunlight. So vitamin D, that's where we get vitamin D is sun. A lot of us are just not in Florida. So if you're lucky you can get sun a lot more, but you know, everybody's like, okay, you gotta wear sunblock because now we get skin cancer and we get wrinkles. So we have to wear sunblock. 
when we're sunblock blocks vitamin D. Our kids are deficient in vitamin D um, because we, you know, being good moms, we smothered in the sunblocks at that time we were babies. Like my generation, where we laid on tin foil and with our Hawaiian tropics oil on. Um, so you've got to take vitamin D and that's best taken with vitamin K2, as a supplement with K2 and with magnesium. So those three supplements together kind of are, are I think, sort of, sort of critical. Um, from a supplement perspective, there's that, that's a hard road. I think you want something, you know, I really like a lot of greens, AG1 as sort of a, you know, cover a lot of bases from a nutrient perspective, because it's an easy little green drink that I can get down that has, it covers a whole lot of needs, including prebiotics and probiotics. Um, the fish oil debate is a very interesting one that we could talk, have a whole conversation on. I used to be a huge proponent on a lot of omega-3s, pushing a lot of omega-3s. They're anti-inflammatory. They're good for your heart. Now what we're learning is that high-dose omega-3s oftentimes become oxidized, either in the bottle or in our systems. And oxidized omega-3s are very bad for your cell membrane. So we're actually getting off of the omega-3 trend. And if you still love your omega-3s, you need to be taking them with taurine to counteract the oxidative stress. So a gram of taurine with your omega-3s. But what we're looking at instead now are 15 chain carbons. So something called fatty 15, which is a 15 chain carbon. And 15 chain carbons do not oxidize the way three chain carbons do, yet they give all the same benefits to your cell health and more. There's a lot more processes that are helped by 15 chain carbons. So a company called fatty 15 has come out with a 15 chain carbon that sort of bypasses the omega-3 problem. And I've trended to having my, all my patients take a fatty 15 supplement. It's one or two a day. So it's really nice. It's not, you know, eight fish oil tablets a day. Um, and so fatty 15 is probably going to pan out as a, as a something kind of ongoing thing that people need. Um, you know, and then I, I like something that if you're really working on muscle building, helping with something like creatine, creatine five grams a day, as we age, we need it for our brain. Everybody needs it for muscle building. That's a great thing to do. Throw it in your protein shake, five grams of creatine. You can buy it inexpensively off companies like bulk supplements and throw five grams of creatine into your protein shake. That, that will go a huge long way for, for maintaining brain and muscle. It's really probably a critical ingredient also for, for helping in our cell uh, methyltransferase processes. So it's probably a really key piece. And then what I like, because we're, we're not doing as much of the intermittent fasting, is using things like fasting memetics. Um, spermidine, spermidine is a polyamine. That it's a polyphenol. It's found in some foods, but in very low quantities. It has a horrible name. First isolated from semen, but it's in very high levels in semen and breast milk. Anything that's in high levels in semen and breast milk is really important to our health. So spermidine can be cycled at a high dose four times a year. You do like six milligrams for 30 days, four times a year to cycle in this big autophagy. Clean off out all the bad cells. It's your clean house, spring cleaning. So four times a year, you can do a high dose. And then you can do a maintenance dose of like two milligrams a day just to kind of keep the house sort of ted tidy, right? But four times a year, you want to just clean out all the bad stuff. And so doing a higher dose of spermidine is a way. So that may be a workaround, things like um, having to do as much fasting. It's what we call fasting mimetic. It acts like fasting for us. So those are kind of some supplements that then we could, we could talk all day again on supplements because there's I have a lot of opinions there too. I do want people to remember that that you taking more supplements is not necessarily better. You have to be careful when you throw a whole bunch of like, antioxidants are good, right? Well, antioxidants are good in certain amounts, cycled. We need oxidative stress. That's how we rebuild. So if you are always taking tons and tons of antioxidants, you're taking your resveratrol and your vitamin E and your vitamin C, you're always taking tons of antioxidants all the time. You're actually turning off some of the good oxidative stress. So that's not a good thing. So you have to really think about this. It's not just throwing a whole bunch of stuff into the mix. You've got to cycle things. You have to know what you're doing with them. And I think that's why you need a guide. You need somebody to help you work with this because it is a lot. Yeah, that was a great list. And I definitely will say for me personally, the highest ROI things I've tried lately probably have been the things we've talked about. Some of those supplements, protein consumption, lifting heavy weights. And then instead of cardio, just sprinting, which there's a lot sprinting, of right. data on sprinting. Yeah, exactly. and I, when I just looked at athletes, I'm like, which physique would I want? And I'm like sprinters. Yeah. And right. when you look, at, if you look at the endurance runners, they don't necessarily, and they're not really equipped to go the long, you know, they're, they're not really equipped to be able to withstand the zombie apocalypse. Right. Um, you know, so 
uh, you're right. So hit training, short bursts, you really only need about 12 to 15 minutes of, but you got to hit it hard, right? Where you sprint, rest, sprint, rest, sprint, rest. But you only need like 12 to 15 minutes of that. So that's easy to add in, you know, into your regimen. Um, you don't need to go out for three hours of running. If you love it because it gives you this runner's high, then 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 go do it. But you got to do the other stuff too. Yeah, that's my routine on actually podcast days. So I'll be doing that after this. I have an obscure question, but you probably are the best person in the world to ask about this. So I inherited some of these athletes that I'm coaching who have shin splints pretty bad. And the only advice I've seen for shin splints is just rest it entirely till it's done. And now I'm thinking, of, is there a reframe of that considering we've established that maybe rest is not always the best option, but is there any other alternative for shin splints? Shin splints are tough. They're, they're what's called a periostitis, right? They're inflammation of the lining on the bone. So it's where the muscle attaches into the bone and the muscle's pulling on that bone and it creates inflammation of that lining. Our bones themselves don't have any pain fibers, but the lining, the periosteum does. So it too is, it, it is an, an inflammatory process that's gone on. Muscle imbalances contribute. So you really have to work on balancing the, you know, the, the anterior and posterior muscle, uh, muscle chains. But that's where when I look at those people, they're in, they're in inflamed states. Sometimes there is an overtraining phenomenon to that, right? Overtraining will create more inflammation. But that's where, you know, like BPC, thymus and beta-4, you can actually even inject, like all people subcutaneously just take a little bit and inject it right close to the shin plants. Super beneficial to, to help that process. You also, one of the problems with um, why those are slow to heal is because there's not great blood flow to that area. So they're very... Once they get irritated, it's really hard to recover. And, and that's why you, you, know, so you just have to you know, rest them well. It's because there's just not blood flow. This is true with tendons too. Like when people get like, you know, a tennis elbow and it won't heal. So one of the things I like to do is get blood flow to the area. How do we do that? I actually have get a little, give my patients a little prescription for nitro bid. You know, so it's nitroglycerin. Um, you can get as a paste, basically a topical, and you can have them tap it over that area it gets this massive amount of blood flow to the area and really helps with healing. And then I love red light therapy on that too. So using some red light can be really helpful in those, in, 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 in those cases too. But again, going back to looking at inflammatory processes. So, you know, are they eating the, enough protein? Are, is their diet good? Have they taken out, you know, do they have all the right nutrients to heal? Again, throwing that Fortigel collagen on those people too and vitamin C really helpful, but it's an, you know, it's a combination usually of increased oxidative stress. So it's where the rest piece, there is sometimes an overtraining phenomena there. Got it. And as expected, I've learned a ton from you in this episode already. And I'm guessing a lot of people have as well and might be wondering, can they work with you since you're one of these rare gems of doctors who actually listens to their patients and um, has done all this extensive research? Do you, how can people work with you or learn from you online? They can go to bodolongevity.com and fill out a little information sheet there and somebody from our office will contact you. There's also a lot, it'll gear you right into, you know, if you want to see, uh, you know, Zach is my orthopedic specialist and I have Emily who does a lot of, um, a lot of work with me as well. So they can see one of us. And then I really encourage everybody to go to bli.academy and join the Human Optimization Academy because there were put on, there's a whole course on orthopedics. There's a whole course on what to fix first. What are my steps to take for longevity? What do I absolutely need to do? There's a whole course on peptides. There's a, you know, a whole course on gut health, a whole course on hormones. So basically they can do these. And again, I, I, I've, I've kept myself out of the sort of world of, you know, nobody pays me to say anything or do anything. And so, so that I, I'm trying to teach you guys just from literature. So what I do is review massive amounts of literature. I try and keep up with it. And I try and sort of digest it down so you guys can learn from that same thing, which is really how doctors should be learning. So that's how you guys are going to have to learn. The doctors aren't learning that way. So if you go to BLI.academy, we also do these monthly Q and A's that are amazing. This group never ceases to amaze me. There's actually doctors who are in the group too. So I won't say all doctors don't learn this stuff. There are doctors who have joined the academy. And so we have these monthly Q and A's. The questions people ask are incredible. Like, like Katie, you would love it because these, you're like, people come up with this stuff. Like, oh my God, where do they even come up with this? You know, and so it always keeps me on my toes too in terms of learning because it's just brilliant people out there. So you can learn from each other in this group, which is really nice. You know, I learn from everybody all the time. So, you know, I think one of, one of my fortunate things is that I belong to this kind of mastermind group of physicians who all 
are working together to keep on top of the trends. So there's about you know 25 of us who are just you know kind of bound together and say, okay, this is this is a really cool thing. How do we get access to it? Where can we get it? Who can we get to make it for us? So we can bridge that gap between something that's just sort of looks cool and actually getting it to people. So you, you have to get the right network. And I'll say the same thing with you guys. Join a network of people who are like-minded, who you can learn with. I'm sure that's, you know, that's why people listen to your podcast, right? It's finding a network of people who all are like-minded. I love it. And I'll make sure those are linked in the show notes for you guys listening on the go. That'll be at wellnessmama.fm. And lastly, a question I love to ask from a personal level is if there's a book or number of books that have profoundly impacted your life personally, and if so, what they are and why. The book I always go back and reread is the book Tuesdays with Maury. And I'm, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys have read it. You know, it's basically um, the guy who wrote it, Mitch Album. He, he, one of his professors from college was dying, Maury Schwartz. And, and as he was dying, he said, he said to Mitch, he said, um, come study with me in my, something like this, come study with me in my slow demise. Um, so you can learn what I'm learning. And he, he really follows him. He goes every Tuesday and he talks to him as this guy's dying, basically. And, you know, a lot of those things you, that we all know, right? Live each day like it's your last, all those things that we know but don't practice. But there's also there's these just incredibly insightful pieces that you can only get from somebody who is facing their end. And then and then even as you, you're watching sort of the brain change and you know, sort of things that, that are where our awareness is changing to different things, how those are interpreted. So I kind of love that book. I mean, he says in the book, you know, everybody knows we're going to die, but nobody really believes it, which is true. I, actually, I'm hoping... Yeah, we can stay alive forever, but, um, but it, it really is that piece of, we, we, we need to kind of keep that in the back of our head without it being forefront. And so I, I reread that book a lot because it just feels like to me, and it's, it's probably my biggest failure is, is I get so caught up in this. I do forget kind of the day-to-day -day living and, you know, and you, you've got six kids. I feel like a lot of times I miss out on things because I'm so busy trying to, to stay up on this other stuff. How do you create that balance? So, you know, and, and he sort of ends with just be compassionate with each other which I think is something that we're seeing less and less of in the world is this, this kind of compassion with each other. You know, everybody's got too many opinions. And, and so it's, it's being compassionate to everybody who has their opinions. I, like I said, I will not argue with the carnivore diet or the vegan diet guy. I, I don't know. I don't know that anybody knows the answer to that. I'm not going to argue it. I'm not going to spend my time and energy doing that. I'm going to say, listen, if that's what you feel best and then do it. So I think that that is really, you know, a book everybody should go back and reread if you haven't read it. Well, I love that. I think that's a perfect place to wrap up. And I know I've learned a lot in this conversation. I'm so grateful for your time and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me and keep, keep on this battle. <laughs> and thanks as always to all of you for listening and sharing your most valuable resources, your time, your energy, and your attention with us today. We're both so grateful that you did. And I hope that you will join me again on the next episode of the Wellness Mama podcast.